2, Proverbs chapter number 2, continue on here in our study of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter number 2, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in a word of prayer before we get started this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for everything you've given us. God, thank you for your mercy and your grace, Lord. Thank you for the love that you've given us, Lord. And I pray tonight, Lord, that you would just open our hearts, open our minds, Lord, to exactly what you have for us, God. God, through the reading, the preaching, the teaching of your word, Lord, I pray you give us something, Lord, that we could take home, Lord. God, and we could apply it to our lives to become better for you, Lord. I pray, Lord, now you bind every distraction, Lord. God, I pray you have me behind the cross, empty me and myself, and fill me with your spirit, and we give this all to you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you get all the honor and all the glory, Lord, and it's in your name we ask this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, last week we started looking into chapter number 2 and to the first four verses here. So let's read the, we're going to read 1 through 9 this evening. I don't know if we'll get through all nine verses this evening, but starting in verse number 1, it says this, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh understanding, or cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous, he is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment, and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment, and equity, yea, every good path. Now, last week we looked at the first few verses, or the first four verses, and we're going to just go through it just really quick. The first part we saw last week in verse number one was the receiving, where it says, my son, if thou wilt receive my words. We need some people who's willing to receive what God has said. Then we saw the reserving still there in verse number one, where it says, and hide my commandments with thee, to put it into your heart, to hide it in your heart, as the psalmist said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Then we saw the relevance in verse number two where it says, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. The only way wisdom can be relevant to us is if we apply it. If we don't apply it, then it's not very relevant to us unless we apply it in our lives. Then in verse number three, we see the running after it. In verse number four, it says, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures. So as you look at that one, that's hungering almost and thirsting after righteousness that we're searching for. We're running after it. We're seeking after God, wanting to learn more about Him, to get that wisdom from Him. But tonight, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4 again for just a minute and see something that might be a help to you. I, want to, I, I noticed it as I was studying yesterday and today. I noticed something different here in verses number 1 through 4 that made a big difference in this chapter for me. So the first thing we see is the supposing. The supposing. Notice what the uh, third word there is in verse number one. It says, My son, if. It says, My son, if. Verse number three, Yea, if thou incline thy, or thine ear. Then verse number four, If thou seekest her as silver. So the first thing I see this evening is the supposing. And then the first four verses, we see the same thing where he says, If thou, if thou. That, and to understand thou is talking to who? You as an individual saying, if thou, if thou. I remember as a child, my mom would say, if you go and do this, then you can get rewarded. Or nowadays, if you go to work, you'll make the money. I saw somebody say something today that said, now we're just going to work to pay for the gas to get to work. That's what we're going to work for now is just to pay for gas. I just thought it was funny. But if you go to work, yes, you'll get paid. If you put in the work, you'll get this and I think about our lives, if we do something, usually we get a reward for it or something happens because of that. And I believe it's the same thing in our Christian life. What is Solomon telling his son here? He's saying, if thou, if thou, if thou, and not to get ahead of myself, pay attention to what the beginning of verse number five says, then. So he's saying these first four verses, if you, if you do this, if you do that, then this will happen. We want God to bless our lives, and we want to always be on the mountaintops. I don't know anybody who doesn't want to be blessed by God or who doesn't want to be on the mountaintop in their own walk. But then we don't receive His words. We don't receive what He's trying to tell us. Verse number 1 says, My son, if thou wilt receive my words. Have you ever seen somebody who actually abides by the Bible, how much happier they are and how much more it seems like God is blessing them? Me and Brother Tommy was talking about it visiting Sunday night. 
he's, he brought up this statement. He says, did you notice the difference in the facial expressions and the way people greeted us at the door if they went to church? And I said, Brother Tommy, there might just be something to it, mightn't there, that the ones who go to church are a little bit happier, the ones that abide by God's words. Don't you think maybe they're a little bit happier in their walk, maybe because they're doing what? If thou wilt receive my words. we got a lot of people who's just not receiving the words. We can't just pick and choose what we want out of the Bible. Is all the Bible popular? No, it's not. Why do you think they want to outlaw the Bible? Why do you think they want to cast the Bible to the side? Why do you think they pick and choose verses to take out of the Bible and change things out of it is because the Bible is a final authority and people don't like authority. They pick and choose. And what he's saying, if thou wilt receive my words, not just some of them, not just most of them, not just a few of them, he's saying, all of my words that are in this book, if thou wilt receive them, if you will go by them, he puts it on the if. Now, as I was thinking about this today, and I'm not trying to nitpick on one area because there's a bunch of places that we can look at our lives or look even at the world of a Christian church or just the lives of Christians in general that we can pick and see some places in their lives that maybe they're not abiding by God's Word. There might be some things even in your own life that you know at this point in time you're not abiding by or His words. But one that I saw is now because it seems that holiness is a thing of the past. And I'm not talking about holiness living like the Pentecostals or uh, the Pentecostal holiness church. I'm not talking about holiness in that sense. What I'm talking about is holiness according to what the Bible says, holiness in our lives, that we're striving to be different. We're striving to be closer to God. And whatever it is that's in our life that is dirtying us up, that's what we're throwing away. And I believe that can come from wisdom, that God will show you this is how you can become more holy. This is what you could take out of your life to become more for Him. And I noticed a verse for the first time. I haven't really ever paid attention to this verse, but it convicted me, and it was Hebrews 12, 14. And it says this, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man, no man shall see the Lord. That's a convicting verse where it says, Follow peace with all men. Now, we could stop right there and just say just the peace part. We're not having the peace in our churches. We're not having the peace in our Christian life. It seems like so many people just are striving for that strife in between one another. People just live for that drama. People just like that sort of thing. Now, we could say on that part of the verse for a while, but then it says, and holiness. And holiness. And it says, no man will see the Lord without them. That's convicting. That's scary to me because I want our church to see God. I want my life. I want to be able to see God. I want Huntley and Easton to grow up seeing God. But it says, without peace and without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Now, some people will take holiness and try to put that legalistic spin on it to where they talk about you have to dress up and no woman can wear britches and no man can wear short. And that's not what I'm talking about in holiness. That's not what holiness is. Holiness starts on the inside of you. What is the inside of you that looks like? And how does the inside of us change? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. See, I know some people who can't afford suits, who can't afford the nicer clothes, but they're some of the holiest people you've ever met in your life. Why? Because they know what it's like to get alone with God. I was watching one preacher. I love to hear him preach. He said, all you need to get closer to God is a pine thicket. That's what it, that was his prayer place, I guess. He said, a pine thicket and a King James Bible and a desire to get closer to God, and that's all you need because once God gets on the inside of you and begins to change the inside of you, the outside will follow up with that. The outside will change to go along with that. But holiness is something that's missing in our churches because it's something that's not popular anymore. But God commanded it to us. In 1 Peter 1, verses 15 and 16, he says this, But as we which hath called you... Is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And we could see just in the holiness aspect that, and I'm talking about even in our churches, in the appearance of our churches, there's not a holiness aspect in our churches anymore to where whenever you walk in, it doesn't look like you're coming into church anymore. To me, that's starting to stray away from that holiness that God had separated us unto that's going away from that holiness and I'm not talking about the world not being holy I'm talking about the church not being holy 
the world, I expect them not to be holy. I expect them to live like the world. But for a church, you would expect a Christian to live like a Christian. Now, whenever I looked up the definition of holy, and at the end of it with Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary, he did put this at the end of it, and I thought that was super important, not perfect. He put not perfect in it. Why? Because none of us is perfect. Are we going to fall? Are we going to mess up? Yes, we are. But there's forgiveness, and there's God with that love that he forgives us for those things, but it's because of his word that we can look at his word, and his word says, that's wrong, you better fix it, you better clean it up, and then it's up to you to decide, am I going to be holy, or am I not? There's only the two choices, am I going to go and strive for that holiness, or am I going to go this way and strive for that sin? Even if you say, I'm not going to choose right now, that's making a choice to not be holy right then, and before too long, you put it off for so long, you're going to continue living in that sin and God does say in Romans chapter number one I know he's talking about who he's talking to but he says there's a comes a point where he'll just give you over to that reprobate mind he just says I'm done messing with you I'm done trying to get you to live whole I'm done trying to do this I'm just going to give you over to your vile affections and just let you go brother Tommy you talk on it quite a bit about that verse that says it would be better to destroy the body and save the soul because of somebody who just continues to live in that sin it'd just be better for them to die because they're harming Christ, living in that sin, and they're not living holy. And what he's saying, he's saying, my son, back in Proverbs chapter number 2, if, if thou will receive my word. That comes down to the preaching. That comes down to God's word. That comes down to anybody who stands up with a Bible as a teacher, as a preacher, anybody. What are we doing with the words? And you could tell, let's just go ahead and say this, you could tell when that preacher gets up and preaches something that it's not according to the Bible. And that's the only time I'd say it's okay to shovel it on back and just say, ah, that ain't for me because that ain't of the Bible. But now we got so many people that's coming into church just because that's what we do on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. But when somebody puts the mail in our mailbox, what do we do? We put a forwarding address on that and say, that'd be better for them over there. Let's, let's send that over there. Or we just shovel it on back and say, that's for the pew behind me. That ain't for me. But what he's saying, he's saying, my son, if thou will receive my word. I like when preaching steps on my toes. Might not like it at the time, but then I know that it's coming from the Bible, and they show us in the Bible, and that, what does it tell us? There's something that's not holy about us right there. There's something different about us that we need to get cleaned up. And what are we seeking after? Verse number 4, look at what it says. Well, verse number 4, it says, if thou seekest, if thou seekest. What are we seeking after? Because whatever you're seeking after, you'll find it. Whatever it is that you're seeking after, You'll find it. Proverbs eleven twenty seven says this, He that diligently seeketh good procureth favor, but he that seeketh mischief, it shall come unto him. Somebody goes out looking for trouble, you can find trouble. You can go out into the world, and you can, if you're seeking after trouble, you can find it wherever you want to. You don't have to have some special group that you go and you get to be a part of. No, if you're looking for mischief, you don't have to go very far. That light's looking to get changed or something to it. I don't know what's going on with that. But if whatever you're looking for, you'll find it. If you're looking for trouble, you'll find it. If you're looking for good, you'll find it. You want to know why people don't like churches or they can't find the perfect church anymore? They're looking for a perfect church, and guess what you can't find? A perfect church. What should we come whenever we're coming into church? We should be looking to worship a perfect Savior. And every church that I've went into looking to worship a perfect Savior, guess what? I found the perfect Savior to worshiping Christ. Uh, Psalm 1 or 19.10 says this, More to be desired, and pay attention to what verse number 4 says. It says, If thou seekest her as silver. Psalm 19.10 says this, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. And then the, uh, the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119, which deals with God's word. Pay attention to these three verses. It says this, in verse number 14, it says, I have rejoiced in the way of testimonies as much as, as in all riches. Verse 72 says, The law of thy mouth is better unto me than ten thousands of gold and silver. 127 says, Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Now David, we need to understand, he's a man after God's own heart. Somebody who is after God's own heart. That God is saying that about him. And his longest chapter, the longest chapter in the Bible, what does it deal with? God's Word. God's Word. What's better than all the riches in the world? In God's Word. Where do we find the wisdom of God? In God's Word. He reveals it unto us. So we say 
that if thou seekest. It's a work. It's a job to go out and to seek. Why do you think 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that is not to be ashamed of the Lord, saying it's a work to go out and do it. Study to show thyself approved unto God. How do we get approved unto God? To study, to work at it. It doesn't just come easy it's if you're seeking after it. It's a spiritual book. So guess what you need to understand the Bible? If it's a spiritual book, what do you need? The Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit that develops that wisdom inside of us. So I got a little bit ahead, so let's go back to verse number 3. I, I skipped over to verse number 4. didn't realize I flipped my page in my notes. But verse number 3 says this, If thou Christ after knowledge, and lift us up thy voice for understanding. When's the last time that we cried out to God to give us the knowledge and to lift up our voice, crying out to God for understanding of His words? And I just said what I was saying about it is the Bible's a spiritual book. What do we need to do before we open it? Pray. What do we need to do while we're reading it? Pray. What should we do after we get done? Pray. It's a spiritual book that we need to be spiritually led through reading and studying. So we see the ifs, the ifs of it. Then pay attention to verse number 5. We see the supply. We see the supply. Verse number 5 says, Then, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Supposing that if we do the ifs, then we can get the blessings of the then. If we do the ifs, then verse number 5 says, Then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord. Knowledge goes hand in hand with obedience. Us to learn about God will go hand in hand with obedience. Gaining and growing in wisdom requires us to answer those ifs through verse number 1 through verse number 4. Notice what happens when Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter number 6, in Isaiah chapter number 6, notice what happens when Isaiah gets closer to God. In Isaiah chapter number 6, Isaiah 6 verse number 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, now pay attention, Isaiah is finally seeing God for who he is. Now pay attention to what Isaiah says. Then said I, woe is me. Woe is me. For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hands, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this has touched my lip, thy lips. Thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. So what we see when Isaiah finally starts growing in the wisdom and in the knowledge of the Lord, and finally as uh, verse number or five said here, it says, Then thou shalt understand the knowledge or the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Isaiah finally is seeing what the fear of God actually is. The fear of God is not being scared of God. It's being knowing that we are unworthy of even being in His presence. I like what they said about, I think it was Lee Robertson or somebody who pastored out in Chattanooga, Tennessee. They said whenever you would even drive onto the parking lot, people would say, You better be careful as you get out and you start walking around because you're liable to bump into God somewhere on the property. And what they were saying was the Spirit was so strong in that place that as you would even step out of your car, you would begin to feel that unworthiness of saying, there's somebody more worthy here than is me. And every single time we wake up and we come to church, we ought to have that feeling in us is that there's somebody here that is more worthy of praise, that is more worthy of glory, that is more worthy of honor than me. There should be that reverence about it, just like if, President of the United States walked in here, like him or not, that doesn't matter. You respect the office that he holds just because he is the President of the United States. You respect that office that they are in. And if we respect the office of the United States, how much more should we respect the office of God, that God would be willing to come down and meet with his people? There should be that unworthiness feeling, and that is the fear of the Lord, is having that reverence that somebody here is greater and it should always end up being just like Isaiah is, woe is me. 
I'm unworthy. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the land of a people with unclean lips. Woe is me. No more is it woe is him or woe is her or woe are they. It turns out to be woe is me. And that is what it's talking about whenever it talks about us or coming in knowledge and the understanding of the fear of the Lord. But then notice what Paul says in Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3. And Paul is somebody who I would say we could lift up some and say that he was somebody that was probably closer to God than what any of us are. But what did Paul say about himself? He said, I'm the chief of sinners. So you see, I am the chief of sinners. But then pay attention to what he says here in Philippians chapter number 3, verse number 9 says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable unto his death. To grow in the wisdom and the knowledge of God means to grow in the relationship with God. If we're going to know God, guess what that means? We're going to grow in that wisdom, just as like what he's saying here. We're going to do those ifs. If we want to grow with God, we're going to do those ifs, and then we'll begin to understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So we see the supplies, and it's if we receive, if we hide his commandments, if we cry after knowledge, and if we seek and search after, then, then will it happen. If you look at Matthew chapter number 7, we looked at this last week in Matthew chapter number 7, one of the more familiar passages in your Bible, Matthew chapter number 7, verse number uh, 7 and 8, it says this, Ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be open. What's he saying? What's Jesus saying there in Matthew chapter number 7? If you do these things, they will happen. If you don't do it, they won't happen. What's Solomon telling us there in Proverbs chapter number 2? If you answer these here through verse number 1 through 4, then will it begin to open to you. And I'm glad that every time that I've set out to seek after God, it wasn't very hard to find Him. Every time I've set out to learn more about God, guess what I've done? I've learned more about Him. Every time I wanted to get closer to Him, guess what happened? I got closer to Him. Just like the prodigal son, once he realized that, wait a second, I've come to myself, I've messed up, I'm straying away, but I remember my father's house, and guess what he did whenever he went home? He didn't have to go find his dad. He didn't have to go search for his dad. He wanted to get closer to his dad, so what happened? His dad was sitting right there, just like God, that God doesn't move. It's us that strays away. God stays the same, and if we're going to go away from God, it's not going to be God that moves. It's going to be us that moves, and whenever we want to come back, God's still right there welcoming us with those open arms, just waiting on us to come back. So we see the supply, but then let's look at the safety. Let's look at the safety. Verse number 7. Verse number 7 says, He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. So what we see here is if we've done the ifs and we've done the then, or we hear the thens, guess what we get now? Look at the second part of that verse. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is. We begin to see the ises through it. Sound wisdom, what that means is stability. That word sound wisdom means stability. And if there's something we should desire in our lives, I like stability. I don't know about you, but I like stability, knowing what's going on and being able to have that stable. I like having a stable house. I like having a stable this, a stable that. We Probably all of us, we like stability because when things change, people don't like it too much, do they? Whenever things begin to change. But that stability, I want stability. But that alludes back to Matthew chapter number 7. I want you to look at this with me, Matthew chapter number 7 again. Verses 24 through 37, or 27, Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 24. Pay attention to what Jesus is saying here. He just got done saying, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy names? And then he goes into this parable here in verse number 24, where he says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and it beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. So what we see at the very first part is the Bible doesn't promise that storms aren't going to come. It says the storm came, the rains fell, 
the winds blew and it beat upon the house, but that house didn't fall for what reason? Somebody heeded to the word. Somebody built their house upon a rock and built it in a stable place. But then pay attention to verse number 20, uh, 26. Verse 26. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Now notice as it's saying this, it, it's not saying that the one that built the house upon the sand and the one that built upon, or built upon the rock was so much different. There's only one difference that we find in those verses. Only one difference. It's not the house. It's not the storm. It's the foundation. What was it built on? What was it there that it was built on? Because the Bible says the house was built. The house was built upon the rock. The house was built upon the sand. The storm came. The storm came. The rains fell, and the winds blew, and it beat upon the house. What happens with the other one? The rains come. The rains fall. The wind blows, and it beats upon the house. One stood, one fell. Why did one fall and why did one stand? It don't take a genius to find out that if you build upon sand, that sand, whenever rain comes, it separates. It goes its other ways and things are going to fall. I find that out at the beach every time you go, or the coast. I'm sorry, the beach isn't, the beach isn't where Christians go. It's the coast where Christians, I'm just kidding with you. But as you look at that, as you look at it, you can tell that whenever that sand comes, it's not very stable to get upon, that you would build upon. And it always amazes me at those houses you go down, and I call them flamingo houses. That's what they look like to me that are like 15 foot in the air, and they've got those whatever, the, the beams and stuff, the pillars, whatever you want to call them. That's down. It, just, it just makes me laugh every time. You couldn't have just moved it just a little bit farther. I don't, I don't know. But as you look at it, and you can see that I would never build my house like that. Why? Because if a big enough storm came, that's going to break. That's going to fall, just like what this man found out is once the storm came, Sure, the house might have been comfortable. The house might have been cozy. It might have been a good house to live in for a while, but let it go long enough, and storms are going to come. Storms came, and it knocked that house down. It says, great is the fall of it. And I fear that in our churches, and even maybe in our churches, today, in our church here, maybe there's some people that they've got the right house. It looks good. Everything looks fine, but let a storm come, and Watch how somebody reacts to a storm, and you can see their relationship with God whenever that storm comes. What are they doing? What are they going after? What are they searching for? Are they searching for answers over here? Or are they going after the rock and saying, I don't know why it's coming, but a Jesus has the answer for it. And maybe if we would just search Jesus and give it to Jesus and build that faith upon Jesus, maybe even if everything goes wrong, and maybe if they do pass away and everything happens, but then we know that we're built upon the rock, and the only way that that happens is because Jesus allowed it. And we're going to worship Him even in it, even if we have to go through the hard time. We're built upon the rock, and our house is not going to fall. That's why I want my house to be built upon a rock, and I mean that even in a spiritual term of the sense of my house with my family, is I want our house to still stand even when I'm gone. I don't want when I'm gone that them be looking around saying, what do we do now? I want them to understand, Huntley and Easton and Tatum here in a few days, I want them to look and say, even though Daddy might be gone and even though our Mama might be gone, there's still hope found in the house of the Lord. There's still hope found in Christ. And it's because of the wisdom and the knowledge that me as a father and her as a mother said, you know what, this is what we're going to grow in. That way it's stable. That way we're built upon the rock that they might not even be saved, but they saw that Daddy loved the Lord and their Mama loved the Lord. So, there must have been something to it, and that's what we should desire in our lives. No matter if you've got kids or not, I'm talking about just in general. Our house should be built upon the rock that whenever the storms come, it doesn't fall down. It's not like what Paul is saying in Timothy that they have the form of godliness, but they're denying the power they have. It might look good. It might look fine, but let the storms come and it fall down, and then you're sitting there wondering, what did I do wrong? It might be because you built a house of cards and you built something upon something that wasn't going to stand, but build it upon Christ because Christ is the solid rock. And he says, upon this rock will I build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's that stability that we should want in our lives. And it's what he's saying there in verse number seven of Proverbs chapter number two where he says, and he layeth up sound wisdom. That's stability, layeth up that sound wisdom. 
And what we're talking about with that is still his word. If his word was good when Jesus died, it's still good today. If his word was good whenever the book was completed, it's still good today. If the book was good for all those Old Testament prophets and all the New Testament apostles and disciples and preachers and our heroes of the faith that have already gone on before us, if the word was good for them, what makes us think that today the word's still not good for us today? Why do we need a motivational speaker to come in or somebody to come in to just pat us on the back? No, give us what the Word says because He's saying that's where the sound wisdom, and that's where the stability is in our lives if we would just build upon the rock. We would build upon the rock. So we see the safety building upon the rock, but then notice as it goes on, He says, for the righteous, He is a buckler. Brother Tommy just read a few verses and the buckler was mentioned there. He's a buckler to them that walk uprightly. Now, people seem confused about what a buckler is. I was too. I was like, I've got a buckle on my belt. Is that what a buckler is to just hold your pants up? Or I didn't know if that's what the buckler was. I knew what a and this has been years ago. This wasn't this week, okay? I knew what a buckler was this week. Some people are still confused of whether it's a big shield. But what a shield was in those days was something that somebody had put in front of them that they could hide behind. What a buckler was was more of the shields of what we picture as shields. And if I'm wrong, you can tell me later. But all my studying, this is what it led to was a buckler is the shields that we see that would fit on the wrist or the arms that they could actually go out with, and it would be used as a de defensive weapon or it could be used as a offensive weapon. But what he's saying is he is that buckler for us. Aren't you glad that we have somebody that we can carry with us, that he's defensively there for us, but at the same time, if we need him to do something in our life, he's going to do it. He's going to go out and he's going to take care of it for us. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. But how do we get to that point where he becomes that buckler for us? He's been a buckler for me even when I've messed up. He's been a shield for me. But how do we get to the point of what Solomon is saying here? Go back to the first verses. My son, if. My son, if. If thou, if thou, if thou, then. Then. He's saying if you're not going to search after wisdom, if you're not going to search after me, you're probably trying to do things on your own. And just like my parents did with me whenever we got the wood stove and I finally got old enough to walk around that wood stove, they said, that's hot, don't touch it. I didn't believe them, so what did I do? I went and I touched it, and you know what I found out was if I would have listened to them, listened to the wisdom that they had for me, I could have tell, told that that stove was hot and I wouldn't have ever got burnt. If I would have listened to them whenever they said, that's wet paint, don't touch it. I'm just that type of person. Somebody says, i got to find out if it is. So I walked up and I touched it, and what happened? Got paint on my hand, but I should have listened to the one that put the paint there that said it's not dry yet, but I didn't trust them, and I went and I touched it. Just like walking into a mall, went into a hot sauce store. I don't know if y'all have ever been in a hot sauce store before, but me and one of the kids in our youth group, we had a bet of who could take the hottest hot sauce and not need a drink for it. Needless to say, we both failed the bet because we had to sign a waiver that would give us this hot sauce. I don't remember how hot it was, but I remember I can remember the taste of it and how hot it was and that there wasn't enough ice in the world and milk in the world to get the hotness out of our mouth. But I went and they told us, they said, it's going to be hot. And I don't like hot stuff anyways. I, I'm a chicken when it comes to hot stuff. Now, I'll do it just to look brave and look maybe more manly to people or try to impress somebody. I'll do it for that reason. But I don't like hot stuff. I just, I just can't stand it. Caitlin likes it better than me. Even hot chips, I sit down with a cup of milk by my side so I, I can wash off that hotness pretty quick. But just like what he said, he said, that's going to be messy. That you're going to mess up if you go in that direction. But we don't listen to the wisdom of it. The man who spoke the world into existence, the man who's holding it in the very palm of his hand, we wouldn't listen to him. He's saying, if you'll listen to me, if you'll have those commandments, if you'll do this, then can I do that for you? Then can I do that for you? Then he'll be that buckler for us. You want to know why he can't be a buckler for a lot of us? Because we've left the buckler just sitting right there, and we've ran off. We said, I can handle this fight on my own. But then all of a sudden, the enemy starts fighting back. We realize it's a real enemy. Guess what we come running back for? The buckler and says, you've got this under control. Or we wait till our house has been completely torn down, just like that man who built his house upon the sand instead of building it upon the rock. So we see the safety there. And that just means protection. Aren't you glad that God will keep us safe? God will take care of us. But a lot of times we get so far ahead of God instead of dwelling in the wisdom of the Lord, dwelling in His Word, 
listening to what he says that we get out of way or get so far away that he can't protect us anymore. And the only way that we can find out that we've messed up and the only way that he can correct us is by chastening us. The Lord, whom he loveth, those he chasteneth us as a father who loves his son. The Lord has to chasten us sometimes that we realize that, wait a second, I've messed up, and I need to get back to Him. Wisdom. It all comes back to it. And tonight, God, I believe, is asking us that same question. If thou, if thou, if thou, if you'll receive it, if you'll do this, then, once we get under that fear of the Lord, then we can realize He layeth up that stability for us. That if we'd build our house upon the rock, we'd see how stable God really is but then the protection through the buckler that he has for us. But it all comes back to if you'll receive. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, this evening. God, thank you for this book of Proverbs, Lord, and what Solomon has said here. God, I pray, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, just search after you, Lord. Search after you like those hidden treasures, Lord. Seek you as silver, God. God, if we run to something uh, with fervency in our lives to earn something, Lord, to Fulfill our lustful desires, Lord. Help us run that much harder, Lord, to uh, seek after you, Lord, and to search the treasures for you. And God, I pray that you just help us, Lord. Help us apply this to our lives, Lord. God, I pray you be with all those that couldn't make it this evening, Lord, and I pray that you be with those that are traveling. And God, I pray you be with all the prayer requests that's already been mentioned, Lord. Pray you keep everybody safe as we go home, Lord, and we ask this all in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.